Welcome to Coaching Uncaged, the podcast on all things coaching, brought to you by Animas. And now introducing your host, Yannick Jacob. Eve Turner, welcome very warmly to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute delight to be here. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this. We had a, a little touch point uh, prior to this conversation where we both were already, oh, let's let's not continue that. Let's save all the good stuff for the podcast. <laughs> so I'm really happy that this happened. Uh, we know a lot of the same people. Uh, and we, we also recently happened, uh, found our way in a book together. Uh, positive psychology coaching in the workplace yeah. so um be, before before i get curious about that um there's many things we could talk about um for those who don't know you uh, you have a, a illustrious career uh, that is uh, you had 20 years in in executive um, um at the bbc you were head of bbc south right yeah yeah so lots of senior leadership experience. You um, for a long time now, since two thousand and seven, uh, you've run your own associate company, Eve Turner Associates. Um, you've done a lot of training, practice uh, in uh, coaching and supervision. You get a master's in coaching. Um, you've done various um, postgrad certificates, diplomas, uh, in particularly in supervising um, coaches, consultants, mentors. Um, you do a lot of uh, charitable work and a lot of volunteering work. And I, that's something I really, really appreciate about you. And it must be part of who you are as a person. You've, uh, you uh, chair of the, of the Apex, the Association for uh, Professional Executive Coaching and Supervision. Uh, you co-founded uh, with uh, Josie McLean and uh, Alison Weibro, the Climate Coaching Alliance. Um, you're also the founder and lead of the Global Supervisors Network, which you run completely pro bono and actually invest a lot of your own resources. So there's really a lot that you're doing for the profession, in the profession. You've uh, wrote widely, you published uh, two books, uh, the, my favorite, possibly, uh, definitely up there in the top five of my favorite coaching books of all time, The Systemic Coaching, you wrote with uh, um, um, uh, Peter, Peter Hawkins, who we also had on the podcast, by the way. Um, so I, I really love a lot of your work, just reading through your articles and publications. There's just, uh, we could film many, many podcasts here. So I, I really appreciate your work. Thank you for making time to be on this. Um, and, and I wonder if there's, um, you know, anything that you would add to this um, in terms of where you're speaking from? I, I mentioned the kind of professional framework, um, but who is who is Eve as a person? I think there's a hint in there, um, but I, I wonder if what you would add to that. You know, I, I think, and by the way, thank you for embarrassing me so much. I, I'm so <laughs> glad this is only an audio podcast because otherwise everyone would see my red face. Um, thank but, you, it I, is video too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hop onto YouTube and oh, see, see okay. Eve blush. <laughs> um, so, um, I, and I should say that I stepped down as chair of Apex earlier this year. So I'm now the immediate past chair of Apex. Oh. Now, I think all our experiences, all that we are, leads us to where we end up, doesn't it? You know, we're all the sum, which is why as coaches and supervisors, it's so important to understand who we are. And the assumptions that lead up lead up to how we practice who we are as a person how we are in relationship with others you know I, I if you ask who I am I, it's such a difficult question to answer mm -hmm. I my father was was um fled with his family from the Ukraine but not really obviously not recently this was in um the the 19 uh, teens how do you say the 19 teens um, <laughs> and and eventually via Austria they they fled to America for a new life having had a program Ooh. against the Jews in the Ukraine which you know that that part of Ukraine was part of Russia part of Ukraine part mm -hmm. of Russia or USSR now part part of Ukraine again and and I'm aware of that and the extraordinary resilience that my grandparents must have had I never met mm. them but to have fled that, to have then set up in a country, America, where they didn't know any of the language, went mm. from being relatively well off to having literally nothing mm. and to work their way through that. So I have huge admiration for that. Um, I think one thing you haven't mentioned is my love of music. And 
<laughs> and that's been throughout my life. And I, I was a really bad conductor of the orchestra. So I, <laughs> so I conducted an orchestra in my first job, which was in music. But what I learned was that if you were in relationship with people, and I loved, I mean, the orchestra and I got on really well, and they just put me right. But it was such a nice relationship where they would guide me, they would suggest things. Um, I said, well, you come out here and you do it. And, and I also learned how the whole was so much more than the sum of the parts. Hmm. I think that was a really, um, a very helpful experience that went through into leadership and has gone through into coaching and supervision. So being in relationship with people um, and developing that relationship, wanting to have good communication, that's always been key to things but also wanting to ensure that everyone has equal access to things that's quite a challenging concept isn't it here we are sitting in our relatively affluent rooms I mean look you've got books behind you I've got books behind me we're pretty middle class that means a whole range of other things doesn't it that we bring and I'm sitting in the UK I think you currently are though not much for long from not much longer that's right and it's so easy to make assumptions, isn't it? I was on a call the other day where somebody said, well, that would only cost the price of a cup of coffee. And I said, well, that price, depending where you're living in the world, could be high or low. Yeah. You know, nothing is absolute. Um, mm. So one of the reasons things like the Climate Coaching Alliance or the Global Supervisors Network are free to all is so that money as much as possible isn't a barrier. I mean, technology is still going to be a barrier. You still need to have money mm -hmm. to have technology. Mm -hmm. So, but 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 that's part of it. So I hope that says something about who I am. It's, it's about inclusivity as much as we can. And we can mean that in so many different ways. Yeah. So just oh, think, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that, uh, particularly that metaphor with music. Um, I'm also, um, I, I spend a lot of time in music. I, I decided not to make that a job uh, quite early when I had the opportunity to potentially do that. Um, because I, interestingly, I didn't want to mix passion and profession at the time. <laughs> and then they look at me now. Well, um, but one of the first coaching clients I remember was a conductor. And it taught me so much about leadership. And as you mentioned, the, the relationship with a group and how much that can carry you or be in the way. You can be the best conductor in terms of skills and musical ability and completely suck at your job because you don't build that kind of relationship. So uh, first we started working on skills and time management and these kind of things, but very quickly it became leadership coaching. And I was sitting there with no experience as a coach. This was one of my first clients. I met him in a cafe pro bono, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm doing leadership coaching. This is incredible because a lot of these leadership qualities, they're already there when people start coaching. So a lot of the, our listeners and our viewers, uh, they'll will be at the beginning of their coaching journey and find themselves in a leadership engagement and, and already engaging. And I think it helps so much to have somebody who's been doing it for a couple of decades share some of their wisdom and some of their knowledge. So extra excited that you're bringing that up. Well, you know, I, I was just thinking one of my early jobs, and I don't want to say too much because obviously there's confidentiality, but I did work um, in an orchestral setting. And so I had the privilege of watching many different conductors conducting orchestras and there was one particular conductor who was one of the best in the world and if we think of transactional analysis and parent mm -hmm. adult child their approach was absolutely parent to child they thought that all the orchestral uh, members needed to be told what to do be directed mm -hmm. and kept in their place and do as you know come in there come in there it was very regulated and there was no sense of fun and and the interesting thing was well you could probably guess the orchestra in a way that i'd never seen before or since just reacted like children yeah, and they started, started playing, rebelling oh, yes. <laughs> and they started being really naughty and i think that's the thing whereas i noticed another conductor who very well known who had an absolute passion for music, popular music, classical music. And they just loved that person because it was fun. It felt like an adult-adult relationship. Mm -hmm. And that was a real learning, wasn't it? Because 
in leadership, just as in coaching, the question I used to ask towards the end when I think I got to be a better leader after I trained as a coach, funny enough, I would ask, what's the leader I need to be for you? Mm -hmm. So not this assumption as in coaching that we will be the same with everyone yeah. or in every context, but what's required of us here and now yeah. in this context. Yeah, and what a wonderful moment when a client realizes that it's not necessarily that this is a bad team or that uh, this is a bad friend or this is a bad person. It's like, well, I'm showing up in a particular way and that has a profound influence on people. And, you know, I'm, I've become a parent eight months ago. And I think that happens for a lot of parents. It's like, uh, oh, your child is amazing. And it's like, what? <laughs> well, whose child have you spent time with? <laughs> like, surely it couldn't have been mine. Um, you know, I'm not in that kind of kindergarten kind of age, but you hear that from a lot of parents. And, you know, when you show up as a parent, then you get a child. And I always appreciated the parents that spoke to their children like adults. And it can be difficult to imagine that. But I, um, I, had, I was at the event when transactional analysis really, really hit me. Uh, you might have been there, actually. I think at the time, you weren't a name on my radar, but actually you were a profound influence uh, on that supervision manifesto that uh, was um, published by, the, by Henley and the, the Association for Coaching. Uh, there was a launch event in, in London. Uh, I was there, yes. Yeah, Jonathan was there, you were there, Peter was there. Um, and it, it was on the drinks afterwards. I found myself in a small group chatting and then somebody came in and really was a critical parent to me. And yes, I have a rebellious side in me, but like I was on complete adult level. I mean, most of the people there were, you know, not twice my age, but you know, <laughs> um, I was a pretty young supervisor at the time. Uh, and this person came in and all of a sudden I acted super rebelliously. And then this person left and I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> That's that's not me. I mean, it kind of is. I have that in me, but like that really changed the whole dynamics of the group when this person came in. And I'm like, oh, wow. Sh interesting how she must perceive me now, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, so I, th I think in supervision, well, and even with, with our clients, I think one of the greatest gifts we can help our clients with often is to understand the impact they have on others. Because mm -hmm. too often we can want to, um, I can only talk for myself, want to change other people. I mean, look, we, many people here will have partners. They'll have mums, dads, children, whatever, whatever, sisters, brothers. We want to change people. Well, of course, that's uh, hiding to nothing. That's never gonna happen. So we have to learn, don't we, to change our own relationship with people. Mm -hmm. And if, leaders can understand that it's that what they're in control of the very mm -hmm. very most fundamental thing back to seven habits of highly effective people you know the most fundamental thing circle of control circle of concern what can we control yeah. and what can we what it, what if we're concerned about we'll just sap all our energy and yeah. it will make no difference yeah. but where are we going to put our energy yeah. and uh, and, and it is interesting, isn't it? Because I think we can really help leaders with that ability to stand back yeah. and to try and see what's going on and think about how they want to react. Yeah. yeah. And what a wonderful service to give to somebody when you as a coach are the person who can offer that experience to someone, right? Because uh, somebody might have a lot of rebellious people in their lives. Uh, and if we don't respond from that perspective you know i often like i sit with a client and i can feel my rebellious child being triggered you know and as a coach i have trained and i have done my work to notice what the triggers are to notice what's coming up and then either to name that and be curious about it or to choose to not respond from that position and once we respond from that more adult position the other person's adult is triggered in response what a beautiful experience for that person to be like oh this was a fantastic conversation. Well, what made it such a good conversation? And some coaches do that naturally. And I think that's why supervision is so important. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, uh, understanding what's going on for us, uncovering our blind spots. 
Could you speak a bit more? I mean, we are already in the with the supervision manifesto, you know, the global supervisors network. You do a lot of supervision these days. Could you speak a little bit to why that's so important in your view? Gosh, there's so much I could say. Picking up one of the things you've said, I one of one of the things I think about supervision is it's it's a meeting between two partners. It's co-created. It's fun. If people don't laugh in supervision, I think. Oh dear, what's going on? Because I, because I think it, there's not a heaviness for me in supervision. It doesn't mean that there aren't some really challenging subjects brought, which might be personal subjects, they might be cases, they might be themes. It's not that. It's just that we are two equal partners in this. It's not about better and worse or um, more experienced telling direct. It's nothing like that. And one of the things that I have really tried to work on for myself, and I hope can happen through supervision is developing the ability you know I'm not very good at remembering things but I think it's <laughs> Wilfred Bion who said the ability to reflect in action not just on action mm. so supervision is reflecting on what we've done mm. but reflecting in the moment so um Nancy Klein who I've trained with who is just like one of my heroines mm. um talks about parallel streams of consciousness and in a way we're having to hold different things, aren't we? Yes, there's what they're saying. There's what I'm feeling. There's what they're doing. It's what's going on under the surface. And it's trying to keep sight of those parallel things going on while staying in the moment. And in the end, it becomes something you just can do. Um, and I think for me, supervision is about, in part, developing that ability to reflect in the moment so people get that sense of being able to develop that external perspective to see what's going on mm -hmm. while they're still part of it. Does that right. make sense? So, yeah, so using what's happening in this moment as we are in relation with each other to learn something about how we are in relation to people. Because yeah. when we coach, we're in relation to people. And if we notice something that's being triggered or you know how we respond to a question or a criticism or curiosity or the story that comes up that we tell ourselves, um, if we reflect on those kind of things, we are more aware as we're in relation with other people, i.e. our clients in, in the supervision context. Yeah. And, relate, and I love the fact that you say it, it's about learning about ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of a supervision session, I can't remember a time when I haven't learned something and, mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've developed through supervising um, mm -hmm. and also helping the other person that we're working with, the supervisee, the coach develop that ability themselves I <coughs> excuse me I often talk about what it is we can't see or we don't see what we don't hear and what we don't say mm -hmm. so it, I, it, I prefer not to call them um, by their old phrases deaf dumb and blind spots because I think that's really unhelpful language but let's think about um, what we don't see in a way what we don't see or what we don't hear, what we don't say are based partly on our assumptions, which we started off the conversation about, partly um, about just time. We can't concentrate on everything. And one of the things I really encourage people to do in supervision is to do recordings and to listen back, even if they don't bring them to supervision, which I encourage them to do sometimes. And we mm. might have a whole conversation about that. It, is to, to watch back, to listen mm -hmm. back, to notice things, because in that becomes a real learning experience. And I do that myself. And, and I won't say who my supervisors are, but they I find them pretty scary. And I still take recordings because I think it's part of my learning. And the learning isn't mm -hmm. just what the supervisor yeah. says, it's actually going through it myself and just noticing those things. Mm -hmm. You know, what we don't hear, you know, it can be just because people are saying a lot, but what we're not hearing under the surface as well as on the surface, what we don't say, perhaps we don't want to upset somebody or we're worried that we might break relationship with them. So yeah. there, are, there are reasons why we don't pick up on things. Um, so I think recordings can be a really helpful part of situation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, I have learned so much. Even before I knew what coaching was, uh, we talked about music. Uh, yeah. I, I did quite a bit of recording uh, and produced my own music. And 
uh, when you're mastering an album and you hear yourself a lot, you start to get accustomed to the sound of your own voice. And I still have that cringe feeling, you know, when I listen to myself, there's a lot of people will have that. And I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching this right now, they're like, oh, I hate the sound of my own voice. Um, do you, so there's two practical questions there. Uh, one is like, how, is there some something that helps people over that? Uh, and the other one is about uh, the permission for recordings or the practical handling of how can we invite that with a client who are paying us and might be concerned about confidentiality? Yeah, I and I think they're very good questions. Um, I have just been involved in a book which will come out in February, March 2023, which is um, the, a coach's handbook on ethics. And oh, with Wendy Ann, Wendy Ann Smith. Wendy Ann. Yeah, wonderful. And and I've written a case study around recordings, <clears throat> and Peter Hawkins and I have written a little bit about this. But I think <clears throat> one of the things we need to do on a practical level is first of all think about how we contract because if we mention it at the contracting stage we and by the way i wouldn't if i was working with someone say in the defense industry there would be certain industries where it would simply not be appropriate to even mention it um, because of the because of the type of work that was going on and the and defense secrets etc um but to mention to contracting, so I often I often say to people, look, at some stage I might ask if I can do a recording. This is because this is how it would be used. Would you be prepared for that to happen? And if they say I'd really rather not, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So I can I can talk about that right at the start. But what was interesting in the research I did for the case study is I asked some of the supervisees I work with, as they bring recordings, <clears throat> what they would say and answer that question. So there were three things. The first thing is you can simply, if you want to hear yourself and get feedback and you don't want to use a client, of course, you can ask another coach. So that's that's I just do a thing. do a practice session. And, yes. you know, it, maybe not the not. best because it's not so real, but they can do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they will just ask a client that they're working with mm -hmm. um, and that client will be fine. How would you, sorry to jump in, but how would you introduce that in terms of how it's being used? What, what words would you use to uh, make sure that your client is comfortable enough to be yeah. able to say no and knowing how much information do we need to give them, how the data is stored, et cetera? Yes, I, I mean, I give quite a bit. So, so, for example, I would say who would hear it, how it would be stored. I would also offer them a copy of it. Mm -hmm. There would be through a link. Um, and then um, I would say when it would be destroyed. I would also offer them feedback from my own supervision on it. So, so actually it adds to that feedback of learning mm -hmm. because I, I remember doing that with someone relatively recently. And so not only did they get what we'd done in the session, but then, then they then got my supervision of supervision mm -hmm. on that session, which I fed back to them. So they got some more learning. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the first is, you know, just do it with, with a colleague. The second is do it with a, 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 um, a client. But what I've tended to do, which I really like, is I, I offer a gift for a gift. And that was something that my supervisees brought up. So they like to say to a client they're working with, um, I'll offer you an extra session of an hour if you would let me record it. So it's like, and I, mean, I won't charge you, it will be an extra session. And so my gift to you is a session, your gift to me is to allow the recording, but with all the provisos we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. And I rather like that because it just feels reciprocal. Mm -hmm. And so that tends to be the way I go. But I think you're very, you're right, Yannick, it's so important to be clear about how it will be used. Mm -hmm. And for people to understand what supervision is, we have a great understanding. We could just go off on one, couldn't we? Talk about supervision, <laughs> we understand. <laughs> yeah. and a lot of coaches, not all coaches, will understand the purpose mm. behind supervision. But for our clients, what's supervision? Because actually in the leadership context, it's something quite different. So I think we yeah. do need to be clear. Yeah, I think there's a, a fear that even though we know the supervisor is not going to judge us on an intellectual level, uh, I think there's a fear of, I noticed particularly with experienced coaches seeking supervision, that there's a sense of how might I come across and there's imposter syndrome going on in a lot of coaches. Uh, 
so that contracting stage that how we present supervision which is why i love the work that you're doing in this space um that we really encourage and not encourage but clarify what supervision is and how it might feel like so that that coaches can drop this idea that this is somehow going to make them bad coaches or reveal that they're not complete or, you know, um, do, do you notice that as well? I mean, you've been doing supervision for a lot longer than I have. And um, I, I think, and I can only, you know, wind back to when I started training, I think it's very easy to see supervision more as a, am I good enough process? Mm -hmm. Am I doing it right process as if, what's right I mean I don't know if someone knows what right is tell yeah. me you know I have no idea um so I really like to wind back and talk with people about the stool of supervision that's supported by three legs and the, the three legs need to be in balance well the stool collapses that's sort of easy isn't it and the first stool being what Bridget Proctor called normative and what Peter Hawkins calls qualitative so that is am I doing this ethically am I um, following good practice yes there's an element of just checking myself against things um, but I hope not in a judgmental way because we can all look at codes of practice we can all think things through for ourselves so that's the first one and often that's the only one people think about when they're thinking about supervision the second one um, Bridget Proctor called uh, formative and Peter calls developmental. And that's the one, how am I developing myself personally and professionally? You know, how else might I do these things? What books might I read? What courses might I go on? Who might I talk to? What leadership books would be fun? I mean, I don't know. There's lots of ways we develop ourselves and our practice. Mm -hmm. Who am I? What's my purpose in life? What's my philosophy in life? That's all part of developing me. Why do I coach? Why do I supervise? That's the developmental side. That's an important part of supervision and then that third one which peter wrote a chapter in the book the heart of coaching supervision and it was called the neglected third leg of supervision which bridget mm. Proctor calls the restorative he calls yeah. resourcing because that's looking after me peter has um this expression which is we can't keep going to the petrol station when our tank is empty because then we're living on the dregs of the tank we need to find a way to keep ourselves topped up. So that's the restorative with Bridget Proctor or the resourcing from Peter, mm -hmm. which is looking after ourselves. Because in the end, whether we're supervising or we're coaching or we're leading, we are the tool and we need to look after ourselves, whether that's mindfulness, going for a walk in nature, whatever it is, we need to make sure we look after ourselves. So that's why I like the concept of that three-legged stool where everything is in balance. Yeah. And then people realize it's not all about one leg, it's yeah. about all three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's so important to, to understand those three functions of supervision, not just for supervisors. We train a lot of supervisors here at Animus as well, the International Center for Coaching Supervision, uh, but to, for coaches to understand that that's what they're getting when they work with a professional supervisor. Uh, it's not all about, is this right or wrong what I'm doing? Or is this ethical? Is this against the rules of some sort? You know, it's not just like, what are the, what's the intervention? I feel stuck with a client. I don't know what to do. And the supervisor is going to help me to figure out what to do in the next session, you know, but there's an element of, well, how, how are you uh, just having, having uh, an outlet of like just having a rant about a client. One of the most, uh, I have a favorite, like not favorite question, but one of my uh, a popular question of mine uh, is what would you like to tell this client if you could say anything, you know, without any consequences? And sometimes coaches just go on a rant and they want to shake people and I want to tell them that they're idiots and that they're doing it wrong. And just to let that stuff out and not eat at you from the inside. Absolutely because it's going on under the surface we may not be expressing it I mean I love that because that's one of the um there's a tool called the seven eyed model and that and that's one of the that's one of the tools when we're talking about how we relate the interventions we make there and there's another one of those which is the third um eye of the seven eyed model which is the island question which I just love as well uh -huh. and yes. that's you know if you were with your clients on a desert island you, so you've been marooned, you're only going to be there a couple of weeks, 
And I, I explained that the island is a safe island, you know, there are no cannibals and they're not going to be eaten or anything. So they've got lots of food and fruit and stuff they can make uh, dwellings with. And what would happen, you know, how would they work together? Would they work separately? Who would take charge? Would they be on opposite sides of the island? Who would travel to whom? And it's so revelatory actually to ask that question. So, so it's a bit of fun. And as you say, exploring all these elements so it's not just about did I get this right or wrong which who knows I certainly don't know and I'm never going to say to someone what's right or wrong um except in the rarest of cases but you know that that that's just not, that's just not going to happen yeah, yeah. So, um yeah um, I agree. can I can I pick you up because as you were bringing that beautiful metaphor I, I sometimes like to ask that question too and it's interesting to hear how you present it um uh, working with imagery, uh, essentially, right, with metaphor. Um, I wonder if there's other uh, favorite tools of yours or techniques or ways to reflect uh, that can help a coach re reflect a little bit more on their practice or something you use in your supervision or perhaps in your coaching. Oh, there are so many. One of the things I like to do, I, I think that, um, I don't know if it's a Western thing or if it's a human thing, but if you ask somebody, what would you, what's the work we need to do today? They'll say, oh, I'm not doing very well with this client. Oh, I've got this problem. I'm stuck with this client. Is I actually ask people to bring all their clients into the sunshine. I mean, I have a, a model I call the halos and horns model. And it's, that's on my list to be curious about. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and all it's about is looking at my practice as a whole and then looking for themes across my practice. Because one of the challenges, if we have a number of clients, is that we'll keep bringing the same ones to supervision. Mm -hmm. So rather than bring the ones where we're doing really well, we're in flow, it's all going fantastically. And I think there's a lot to be learned from sharing what's going well and thinking about what's going well about this? What puts me in flow? How do I prepare when I'm in flow? So I just think it's easy to see supervision as the place you go when things aren't going well. I think it's the place that you go when things are going well as well oh, yeah. and reflect oh. on that too. Such It got to be a balance like that. So that's all the halos and horns method does. It, it, looks, at the, um, it looks at one's practice as a whole and then looks to identify themes within the practice and then relates it actually to transaction analysis. But it's very simple and it's great fun. And another one is just to think of our clients as... Um, you have to do it really quickly, but think of our clients as an animal. And then you go through it, through it met metaphor, or use cards. I've got on my shelves behind me, I've got lots of things that I've bought in um, children's. Um, you can get shops where you can get children's toys to make bracelets. Uh -huh. So you can get little objects and you can use objects. So I think anything that's fun and is insightful, I don't think we need to talk all the time. The other thing I'd say is... Um, Sometimes there's a, a chapter in the book, The Heart of Supervision, where um, that there's some written exercises you can use with people because sometimes things like at the beginning of a session, just having some quiet time, particularly for in people with an introversion preference, how am I arriving today? Mm -hmm. What's important for me to be thinking about today? Mm -hmm. What's disconnected that I'd like to connect today? So just mm -hmm. giving people a bit of space to think quietly Mm -hmm. yeah um, and it, it, sorry to jump in there but it goes yeah. to show how important it is to have a bit of a sense for how that person in front of you is how they best learn what kind of person they are you know because you might need to uh, uh, start the session in a different way depending on who you're working with yeah I think that's really important so I'd like to hear some of the the tools that you use we've talked about the seven eyed model we've talked a bit about imagery and what do you use as well mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I, I at some point it dawned on me that you can just ask people for metaphors <laughs> <laughs> I, I always love to work with metaphors as they kind of emerged and then kind of expand them be curious about them but you can just ask them what so what's that like if you if you were to think of a metaphor for this and, you know, that often throws people and they, they go into this space where they start thinking and then they often come up with the most amazing things. Mm. Um, I'm not a big tools techniques person, uh, I got to say. Uh, I mean, I got trained existentially. So my, my main method is the phenomenological inquiry. 
right? So be really present, bracket what I think I know, put all of my stuff in the box as much as I can, put the lid on and be really curious about what's emerging there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you invite your client to just describe their experience of whatever phenomenon they're describing, uh, often new meanings emerge. And I really like that. Um, I know, I think you've also published um, or contributed a few tools to that 101 supervision tools book, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's so much out there. And I know so many coaches and supervisors, they absolutely love a good tool. Uh, and I love it in a, when it, it starts a conversation. Um, and that's really important, I think, when it's, it starts working with tools. Whenever I do use a deck of cards, it's, it's fantastic. I love it. I just find myself naturally not necessarily going there. Occasionally, something pops up from my backpack. I've come across a lot of it from positive psychology is full of tools. You know, I, I love working with strength, you know. Um, and when, uh, when I meet a client who I think would really respond well to an exercise or to a, you know, dare I call it homework or, you know, something they could do between sessions and they love a good questionnaire, you know, and then you have so much to talk about when they come back with it. As long as you're not judging someone on the try, thinking that the tool is going to figure them out by itself, uh, then I think they're wonderful uh, additions, so wonderful gateways into a conversation. Yeah, and I think that for me, that's so true that it's easy for a tool to be a substitute for just being, mm -hmm. being in relationship with another. Mm -hmm. And... I'm really grateful for having trained with Nancy Klein because along with many other trainings and, and having written with people and particularly my work around systemic um, coaching supervision, which we might come back to, I think the most fundamental gift we have is the gift of really listening. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, we don't need any tool for that. And, yeah. and we can forget as coaches as supervisors as leaders just how profound and extraordinary that gift is and for the other person to be really heard to be able to say anything to know they won't be judged yeah. and to be allowed to make the connections for themselves and I think that's the thing with time to think that you only talk if you really have to and then it's a last resort yeah so people get the opportunity to make those connections for themselves and yeah. and uh, peter may have talked this to you but there's there he, he but often he's he's written about this this distinction between competency capability and capacity and you know the competency is you know you know the tools the 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 capabilities you know how to use the tools and when and then and then the capacity is just be hmm. and and just be in the presence of another person. And that's the yeah. magic. Yeah. You don't need anything except your, your whole self. Mm. Yeah, I think Eric Dehan wrote that at some point, that uh, what he does in executive coaching is basically be really present and share some of what you see. You know, <laughs> that there's, there isn't really a, a methodology that you need to use very often. You just need to be there. And I'm, I was curious about that. I wonder what you think. Um, the thinking environment, the promise not to interrupt, you know, just wait until they're finished thinking. Um, it stands like uh, on a spectrum. One spectrum is never interrupt. And I've seen uh, Linda Esper did a session in our coaching lab um, where uh, she never interrupted. And she waited until the client was finished. And it took half an hour. And then she asked whether there were some more thoughts. And then there were another 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then the session was over, you know, and the client found it incredibly helpful. But also some of us couldn't help but think what could have happened if we were to offer or offer a question or, you know, share an observation if we had one. It struck me at some point that it seems that this approach is the most effective with people who already have a very high quality of thinking and that perhaps some people might they need one? They would certainly appreciate one. Some people go in circles and ruminate if you don't interrupt them. So I think there's a time when I think there's an obligation for us to disrupt or interrupt or uh, at least offer something because otherwise we just sit there while the person is going in circles. 
I, I think we need to remember that, that everything comes back to contracting. And when we contract with our clients, we will talk to them about how we'll work with them. And people who will choose to be worked with in that way know that's the way they will be working. So it's not like it's a, a surprise or a shock to them. And people make choices. And I think all our clients are, as are all our supervisors, you know, we're all adults in this and we make choices and we decide whether it works for us or it doesn't work for us. So I don't think I can come up with anything clever to say because I've worked with clients where we've done exactly what Linda describes and then they might say and in the last 10 minutes I just like some of your observations and we've contracted for that and that's what will happen so I think it's all in how we contract and interestingly I've done some sessions on because I'm trained as a time to think supervisor and it's one of the ways we might work but again contracting with the people I supervise some sessions might be done in the time to think way others won't be mm. And I've done some demonstrations of it with really experienced supervisors. And what they found extraordinary is how difficult it was for them not to say something. Mm. And the learning of when they weren't able to, how much more thinking the person was able to do without their intervention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like asking what else? So much yeah. more is coming out. Yeah. And Time to think supervision is fantastic, actually, because it it does some elements of the what else and uh, completely non-directed. But then there's some elements where you say, and is there anything you'd like to ask me? And would you like my observations? So it's a little bit more of mm. the supervisor into it. But it is interesting because we, I suppose we've been trained to think it's all about questions. Um, certainly initially, you know, I think about how I was trained, it was the grow model, and then there were lots of things I was told about as well. And just to be in relationship with another, to provide safety and containment, that ability to really say what I think. I know people can go around in circles, but they're their circles. And my experience is they often get to a place that they're really happy with. But it's through the circles that they get the other side. Mm, yeah, because some circles might be a spiral and you yeah. notice slight changes in the next circle and then another one yeah. in the next circle. And it can be painful to sit there and let somebody yeah. do their work. And I think a lot of coaches really want to accelerate and they yeah. want to go get in there and they want to get them five levels up in their spiral. And I guess sometimes that is really helpful and sometimes that is really unhelpful because... Yeah. People need to do their own process. So I don't know. How do you think about that? Do we need to allow people to do their own process or can we disrupt, change, accelerate? I think part of what it can be is our own discomfort, as you've identified. And I don't think I have an answer because I think every context is different. And so um, I maybe there are times when I might feel I'm earning my money by asking questions or I'm saying something. And I'm not sure that's the picture really, that, that's the whole picture. It may be by providing the containment where the person can really work things through for themselves. Yeah. So I, like most things, I think it's a continuum and it, it's what is best. Give me the context, the contract, the person, the, the team, whatever it is, and we'll see how we'll work, that will work best for all the stakeholders. And we haven't talked a lot about systemic work, but I, but I think every, every context is so multi-layered and so different. And then yeah. and there are elements of that that will be brought into. Yeah, I, I really want to emphasize that point because I, I've seen so many coaches, especially in the beginning, they want to do things. They want to be active. And once they understand that holding space is a doing thing, You know, what they're doing is they're holding space and they make the space safe and they're doing active listening. Then a lot of them freed themselves from trying to intervene because that's how they earn their money. Yeah. Mm. And you know what? I don't know about you. I find really active listening is very tiring. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I can't do what some people, I can't have client after client after client. I have yeah. to have long breaks. I have to be able to go on a walk. I have to be able to really just decompress and start again mm. it, 
it takes a lot out of you to really, really listen. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, one of the things I like to do in coaching work, but in supervision work, is um, bring other stakeholders into the room. So, um, and you may have talked about some of this with Peter, but, you know, bring in some of the best um, examples I can think of have been um, bringing the family into the room mm -hmm. where people are making assumptions and then you say, well, what would your children say about that? Or what would your partner say about that? Or the obvious ones are, what would your team say about that? What would your boss say about that? What would the shareholders say about that? And uh, just, just to jump in there, what would you say to someone? Because I'm, I'm fully on board with that, right? And I yeah. need to sometimes bracket my own perspective. If somebody's sitting out there and saying, well, but my client is already way too concerned about what other people think about them. Well, what do you say to that? Well, I think, but you see, again, I go back to, it's always about the context and we're always making a judgment and we're never saying that one thing works in every situation. It was like, would we always do recordings? No, not if somebody was working in the defense industry or they really didn't want it. So I, it would be a, a judgment. But I think even in that case, it might be valuable because the assumption might be they tell me, well, in the case of one of my clients, I can remember, they, they said, well, my children would say this. I said, well, would they? Let's just bring them in the room and ask them a question and then ask another. And, th and then they discovered through doing that, and it may sound strange, but they discovered through doing that, that they wouldn't have said what they were thinking at all. By the, almost, the silly, I and mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Bring a chair in the room. But, but by that act, they broke their own thinking mm -hmm. pattern um, mm -hmm. and, and came up with something different. And um, I, I've got a book that comes out in about six weeks, which Peter Hawkins and I wrote with the late Alison Wybrow, because sadly mm -hmm. Alison died earlier this year and mm -hmm. Joseph Keane. So it's a CCA book with Peter Hawkins helping. Um, uh, one of the things we did, we set up a supervision group to work on um, what should we put in this book that was about the climate and, ec and ecological emergency? Um, how, how could we work as, sup um, as supervisors and supervisees? So it was 10 of us, eight supervisees and two supervisors, but actually all working together to see what we could experiment with. And I, there's just this most beautiful story about how nature was given a voice. And so one of one, so in this group, um, the eight people, one brought, a, one brought a case and the other seven all took different positions. So one was representing the coach, one was the a client, one was the family, one was the community, one was the sector, which was the education sector, one was nature and so on. And that just ended up in a place, if we hadn't done it that way, giving all these elements of voice, we wouldn't have got to where we got to, which was fascinating. And I don't want to give too much away because it's a, it's a beautiful story, but I think working in that way is also really valuable. Thinking of what are the voices we need to listen to? What are the voices we're not giving yeah. a space for? Any, any other practical ways to bring that about? Peter mentions, for example, bringing empty chairs into the room. Uh, you mentioned just simply asking, about what would such and such say. Uh, it's a luxury to have a group of observers that we can assign roles to be curious about. Yeah. Uh, what, well, what else might we do? Well, in group supervision, of course, it's much easier because I, I run lots of yeah. groups and and it's easy for someone to bring a case and then other people to act yeah. elements of it. You know, that the person bringing the case briefs people. Yeah, I'm thinking about one-to-one -one coaching that context. But in one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, bringing the challenge room, I, I do all my work virtually. It's, it's more a... Uh, in your head sort of thing. I actually often say, have you got a chair in the room? Well, just imagine so and so's in that chair, so and so's in that chair, and and and, and do it that way. Um, Ooh, old uh, old phones. Everybody's got so many old phones. I'm sure you can install <laughs> Zoom on each of them and then bring them into the room and name them. Wow, wow, that would be very interesting. How did gosh, how did that? And of course, you can use you can use um, objects. You can mm -hmm. use cards. I mean, there there are there are lots of ways you can do it. Um, so I, I suppose those are the main ways that I can think of doing it in supervision, but um, other ways, you know, by giving um, your clients, if you've got a, a group of supervisees, a group of coaches, getting them to think of each of their clients as an animal. 
you know, we talked about that earlier. Yeah. And then working that through, because if someone says to you, I think of my client as a lion, then you can oh. say, oh, What does that mean to you? <laughs> you first of all, you, you talk as the lion. So as the lion, what's the lion doing that makes it uh, helpful in its own setting? What does it do that gets it in its own way? How uh, to describe it, first rather than interpret. Yeah. So mm -hmm. describe what, what's the lion doing um, in relation to other communities in the area? And you just get them to sort of build a bigger and bigger picture. Um, and then at the end, you come back to, so now what's your learning about you and the client and what might you do moving forward? Right. Oh, can, I, can I just pause there? Because I, I think it's so beautifully done to bring a systemic lens on working with a metaphor like that. Because my immediate, like you already heard that, it's like, oh, what does the line represent to you? How do you make sense of a line? What attributes does a line have? But this is really a different way of working with that metaphor. Ah, yeah. oh, lovely. Yeah. How's the lion relating to all the other lions in the pack? Uh -huh. You know, that might be a question. Uh -huh. How's the lion relating to other species on the savannah or wherever it is? I'm not very good at uh, Don't go too far with this. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it, it, it's things like that. But also, of course, it's playful. Because if you're doing it in a group, you can have a lion, a mouse, an elephant, and I don't know, a rhinoceros, and they can all be chasing after each other. And it's just great. And it is great fun to do things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think to come back to it, I think supervision should be fun. But I also think that, um, you know, to pick up on what some of the things that Peter would have been talking about is it's also, also about challenging some of the ways that we have done things in the past, because mm -hmm. we are in a very different situation in 2022, which is when we're recording this, to how we would have been 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and where the world is, you know. I I mean, I'm I'm sitting here and, I, and I've just literally, the last few days, as you know, because I told you, I've just been doing the final edits for a book, and I wish I could have changed things, because as I was finishing this book, uh, I was just reading what Antonio Guterres was saying, United Nations Secretary General, about how the floods in Pakistan are a warning of what's happening in the world. You know, a third of Pakistan underwater. So we have a country which is least responsible for having caused climate change, now absolutely suffering the effects of climate change. So for me, all my work is about not business as usual, because I think I'm conscious of the challenges of supporting a system that I think is broken, you know, an economic system. You and I are sitting in the UK, and I'm sure many people listening won't be, but in the UK, we've just had what's called a budget where um, tax cuts have been given, mostly um, it, uh, helping the people who have the highest incomes. And the basis of it is economic growth and economic growth is an interesting concept because mm -hmm. we grow but we grow at the expense of the planet because I think this year was it July the 28th was earth overshoot day which means by July the 28th we had used all the resources of the planet that could that should be used in a year because it's an ability to regenerate in a year. Mm -hmm. So by July the 28th, we'd use all those resources. Often an economic growth is about using natural resources yeah. and they're running out and we're- We're actually, eight months into the year. Yeah, so I, I think whether it's supervision, whether it's coaching, I'm really conscious that there's an underpinning of mm. what's ours to do. Mm. And so, you, you know, you started by asking about some of the work I do and the Global Supervisors Network, Climate Coaching Alliance. But part of it is I, I will never want to say anyone should do anything because I think we all make our own choices and that is the individual ability to do so. However, we do work best in community and what we can do is always the question, what I can do and what can I do with others? Mm -hmm. um, and that's always a big question. So that will underpin everything. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask something about that. First of all, can you just briefly name the book uh, so people can go and Google the title? Because by the time they're listening to this or watching this, it might be out already. Oh, that that's very true. Well, thank you. That that's um, that's very helpful. So, what I will do, if I may, I don't know. I have the ability to share my screen, and you did say that this was going to be 
um, visible as well on YouTube. If, if people so choose to, I, yes. So I'm just playing, I'm playing for words because I'm going <laughs> to um, show the, the book cover. Then it will be even easier to see. Has, so let is, me, that, is that public yet or is this uh, an exclusive? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure how much it has been seen. So um, certainly unusual. So that's, that's what the book's called, Ecological and Climate Conscious Coaching. No, I've seen that before. Yes. To Evolving Coaching Practice. And the idea, as you can see, we're sitting around a campfire. And what you get from the book is it's a, it's a storybook because it has 66 contributors and it's their stories that are at the heart of the book. Um, so I'll, I'll stop the share now. But um, it's based around a cycle which takes us from being curious about um, the, the whole area of climate and ecological crisis, if you like, which, by the way, is, for me, indivisible from issues around diversity, economics, uh, inclusion, health, because what you will find is the people who have the worst health income outcomes often have the lowest incomes, mm -hmm. may often live in some of the most polluted places and so on. So this taking climate, it's, it's a symptom rather than a cause. It's a mm -hmm. symptom of so much else. So, um, yeah, so, um, gosh, I've lost my train of thought now. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Can I, can I throw in a, a question there? Because I'd love to frame that question in the context of a theme that's been running through this podcast, which is transformation. Uh, Animus as a school teaches transformative coaching. Uh, I've been talking, I've been asking most of my guests about their perspective on transformation. And given the context of what you just talked about, this is also something I talked about with Peter. It seems that there's a particular transformation that needs to take place in terms of how people relate to this. I also noticed you offer transformation uh, coaching for transformation on your website with leaders, executives. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder what kind of transformation you think needs to take place here and what's your perspective on, on transformation in this context? Yeah, it's interesting because I think I'll, I think I'll remove that from my website. Um, thank you for pointing <laughs> that because I, I'm not sure I like the word transformation. Uh -huh. And it's just, I think it's a personal thing because I, find that if I feel I have to be transformative it's like a well how do I do that how will I know if I have how can I be successful how will I know if I failed I I think as in everything it's all about dialogue you know I sit here they're very passionate about some things but I want to retain my ability to be in dialogue with anyone about them yeah um, Sorry, can I can I jump in there? If I were to give you a context for transformation as a a significant shift in paradigm, might that help? I mean, it, it does help in that I, I mean, I've in the ethics book, the handbook on ethics that comes out next year. I've written a chapter, um, and that is about the paradigm shift that's needed for coaching in relation to cl the climate and ecological emer emergency but I suppose what worries me about the word transformation is that it, it can feel a pressure, mm -hmm. a pressure yeah. to be transformative and I and um, whether that's for me as a coach as a supervisor for the leader um, but if it's about shifting our thinking I have no doubt that we all are in a time where we all need a shift in, in yeah. the paradigm of our thinking. So what, what paradigm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have an eye on the time and I think this is so important. Like what's the paradigm shift that needs to take place for people or which people? And what's the role of coaching so that we can contribute to that? Gosh, that's such a big question. Can we have a whole podcast? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there are some simple questions we can ask. You know, when I ask, um, what, what would you, Yannick, like from supervision today? 
I'm asking a question that's quite an individual focused question. If I say to you, what's the work we need to do together today? What's the work that's being required of us? You know, given everything that's happening, what do we need to do? It's more listening to what is required from us than meeting the needs of any one individual group. I, I'm really hesitant to talk about this so briefly because people need to earn a living. And I'm really aware that, that we work in a way that um, often people are being paid by organizations. But there are questions we can ask, you know, which organizations we want to, do we want to work with? What are we prepared to say or ask? What questions? So if we're working with, or I'm, I'm working with an organization that is say in tourism, and they are quite, they are net users of carbon and they, and they have no plan about that and it's not part of their thinking. Asking questions like, um, who are your customers of the future? Where are your, your next generation customers coming from? Where are your next generation staff coming from? Mm -hmm. What will be their interest? What will they expect from a company they buy services from? That helps shift things, but yeah. it isn't, sort of me dictating to them this is your agenda yeah, it's yeah, yeah. me as a coach simply raising what i think is right i ask them yeah. about that all sorts of things so i ask them what about their future are they thinking of future generations are they thinking forward asking people about legacy is really important too yeah let me jump in there as well quickly because i hear that a lot from coaches that want to, they have a, a climate agenda in a way, but they don't want to bring that agenda into the room because coaching is something that is client led, right? As it's often said, uh, but asking, a, being curious about legacy, the next generation of customers, you know, it's a very respectful way to work in service of the client. I know Peter doesn't like that kind of language because, you know, not necessarily in service of the client, but we are re responding to what, the coaching is supposed to be about, which is what they want and what's good for them. But we're opening up a different pathway to thinking about something um, that is in their best interest. So it's all a balance, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. I think if we think things are black and white, we do a disservice to the continuum and everything in between. And mm -hmm. it's easy to be polarized, isn't it? It ought to be this or it ought to be that. I think when we're being paid by organisations, there will always, always be something about what's the work we need to do that does relate to um, I want promotion, I need to be able to speak in public and, and that's fine. So I think it's just finding a balance between those two, but respectfully bringing in the other perspectives, because I think one of the most fundamental things I have issue with is just to say to a client what's the work you want to do today and just end there mm -hmm. because it is about the work we need to do and the need is about stakeholders it is about their family it's about their community it's about them it's about looking after themselves so it's about opening up a conversation Josie um, McLean who, who's one of the the co-founders of the Climate Coaching Alliance does a wonderful exercise which comes from Roman Krasnerich's book, The Good Ancestor. And teams absolutely love it because what it allows them to do is look backwards in generations and look forward generations and think about what is there for the work I want to be doing now. And, it's, and sometimes it's just opening up. This is what coaches do. They open up possibility yeah. and do it in a safe space. Could, could you just explain Practically, how might a coach bring past and future generations in? It's again, it, I mean, actually, it's one of the many exercises on the book, because I was saying, you know, the book starts with Echo Curious and it goes to being informed and it, and it goes through various exercises you can do. And this is one of the exercises in the book. And it's simply about looking it, it, you start in the year 2022, don't you? You look backwards, perhaps, to somebody who was your grandparent or great grandparent, and think about what life was like then. Mm. And then you and you think about them, and then you picture them in your mind. Then you come back to the present day, and think about someone who's very young now, 
and then picture them and then go forward to when they might be 90, when yeah. you'll be long, long gone. And they look at a picture of you and think, what do you want them to be saying? Uh, about you? Yeah, that, that's similar to what Peter had described. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that comes from the good ancestor. Yeah. And it's, it's an incredibly powerful one because you can do it um, somatically as well. So you can step forward, step back. Yes. Forward, step and I think that's the important part that we find an emotional connection to that. It's not an intellectual exercise. It needs to be an embodied one. I have that with gratitude a lot that people's, the impact that a gratitude exercise, if that's, you know, three good things in the evening or just waking up and doing a gratitude meditation, the people who think intellectually about what they're grateful for and list it, they get a tiny fraction of the impact that people have that really tune into that emotion, that feeling, that sense of gratitude. So having finding an emotional connection and we can bring that about. And this is the same for consultations, right? If, uh, if we have a chemistry session or a consultation with a prospective client, uh, don't just ask them what they want their future to look like, but put them into the future and ask them questions that make it come alive so that they have an experience of that future. And that potential, that's what the fee is in relation to. And all of a sudden it becomes very easy to say yes to it because you've had an experience of that change. And that's Josie's experience of working. This is team coaching where mm -hmm. people are given the space when they're thinking about what's the purpose of their organization what's the work they need to do as an organization to open it up and think about this in a broader context because we don't live isolated you know we were told weren't we i remember when i was training you know you sort of live, leave yourself outside the coaching mm. well, of course you don't you come in with all your foibles and your assumptions and everything else and so um and yeah just this ability to allow people to bring every part of themselves into the team coaching into the coaching yeah Oh, I love that, Eve. Um, we could indeed talk for many more hours. Um, I, I had in mind potentially to ask you about ethical dilemmas and tricky decisions that coaches have to make, which you wrote about. Uh, you also wrote a, an article that says uh, it's called When the Police Come Knocking that I was so curious about. Um, uh, that you wrote about unconscious dynamics that find their way into the coaching room. Um, so there's so much out there. Um, you've named a couple of books. Uh, I think whoever listened to this or watched this um, have a plethora of fantastic material that they could dive in deeper. Um, where would you send people other than, uh, you know, all these resources are listed on your website, um, which will, that's uh, Eve, Soci uh, Eve Turner Associates. Um, are there places you would send people to the uh, the supervisors network, obviously for supervisors, other places that uh, people could benefit from spending some time in? I think there are so many places we can get benefit from. And, you know, we can get benefit by, by talking and working with people in our own communities. In a sense, mm -hmm. we've lost our connection with our own communities. I mean, I'm really lucky where I live because I know all my neighbours and we do things together. And, we, and, and I, so I think... It's not just about reading academic books or, and, and I tend to read a lot of novels just for light relief, you know, and stuff like that. I think I would, I would say being open and being curious to all, because we learn from so many things in so many ways, don't we? And anything can be a learning experience. Truthfully, anything can be a learning experience. It's about us and our ability to be open to it rather than what it is we're reading. Because I could read, I could send people to say, read this book, it's the most wonderful book in the world. And it, it may not be the right book for them at that time. Um, so I think if people are genuinely interested in the climate emergency, um, apart from ordering the book, um, if they want to, joining the Climate Coaching Alliance is easy because it's free, it won't cost them anything. There are so many events going on and they're all free to join. So that gives people a chance to be in community. There are geographic communities, there are subject communities. So if people are interested in politics mm -hmm. and climate, if they're interested in education and climate, there are different subgroups. So there's a communities page on the website. Mm -hmm. So I think going where our interest is and not giving ourselves a hard time, actually, and just enjoy what we do. And and being with others. That's what I'd say. Mm, I love that. Eve, thank you so much. Uh, I know we'll meet again. Um, 
Thank you for your time once more. Thanks for listening to Coaching Uncaged. If you want to find out more about becoming a coach, developing your coaching skills further, or training as a coaching supervisor, then head along to animascoaching.com. Thanks again and catch you on the next episode.